Grant Wilbur is an intelligence and national security studies major. Uh, he will be graduating uh, senior. He'll be graduating in May of, of 2021. Uh, and Grant uh, had some spent some time in uh, in Asia, actually in Japan. Uh, was very interested in that culture and that region of the world. So he's one of our capstone students who's writing his capstone senior thesis on uh, on China's uh, rise, its power rise uh, as a regional power, and now expanding to be a global power and applying uh, in international relations, we call something called power transition theory. And so he's looking at that particular uh, theory as an ex providing some explanatory value for, for understanding what China is doing. So again, perfect topic ties into his research. And so he uh, is available this morning to, uh, to introduce our speaker. So Grant, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kilroy. I'd also like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm gonna be introducing our speaker who is Dr. Murphy. Uh, Michael Murphy is an assistant professor of international business at the Darla Moore School at the University of South Carolina. Professor Murphy's primary research interests include globalization, innovation in emerging economies, technology standards and market formation, as well as in an intellectual property rights. His research considers China in comparative perspectives with other emerging economies in the developed West. He has conducted field research in China since 2007 and speaks fluent Mandarin. Professor Murphy has published multiple peer-reviewed journal articles, as well as a book, chapters in edited volumes, and numerous commission reports for groups, including the Global Commission on Internet Government Governance and the U.S. National Academics. His book, The Run of the Red Queen, Government, Innovation, Globalization and Economic Growth in China was published in 2011 and was the winner of the 2012 British International Studies Association Susan Strange Best Book Award and Bronze Medalist for the 2012 Axiom Business Book Award for International Business and Globalization. He teaches globalization and international business in comparative innovation systems he has also taught political economy of innovation in China and introduction to international political economy as well. Professor Murphy has a PhD in international affairs, science and technology from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 2014, a master's in international affairs from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 2006, as well as a Bachelor's of International Affairs from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 2004. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Grant. And there, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kilroy, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I sincerely wish that we could be in person to uh, share the share knowledge and share questions and learn and develop together. But unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. And so, Today, I've prepared uh, a few remarks on the question of global supply chains. And uh, hopefully you'll find the topic interesting and then we should have time at the end for uh, questions and comments. And hopefully we'll have a lively interaction such as is possible through the Zoom interface. And uh, as I'm going through the presentation, if uh, I'm going too fast or something appears to be amiss, um, please shout it out. And I will be happy to rehash, to take a step back, to slow down, to speak more clearly, et cetera. But without further ado, let us go ahead and uh, start the process. All right, so global supply chains and US national security. And of course, for this, uh, I have chosen, as is most appropriate, the picture of a uh, mask factory manufacturing PPE, personal protective equipment in China, because the ideal of what we will be discussing today is to first offer an introduction into why global supply chains are important for national security, different perspectives on how that might be managed, and then looking at the situation in the world over the last decade, and then also at the situation directly facing us today, both regarding the pandemic, but also looking into the future with the emergence of new industries. So it's quite a bit of uh, ground to cover. So hopefully um, we'll be able to generate some interesting insights. So 
I always have appreciated this comment, uh, which in interestingly, I saw a version of it for the first time reading a Tom Clancy novel many years ago, but it's from General Robert Barrow who comments that amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals study logistics. And so what this implies to me in the context of global supply chains is that the process by which goods and services are delivered and the ability to deliver necessary goods and services on demand and when they're needed is one of the most crucial aspects, not just in military, but in terms of civilian life, in terms of business operations, et cetera. And in addition to General Barrow, this is not a unique insight. So if we go back to uh, looking at the past, you can see that throughout history, economics and security have always been seen as being tightly integrated. If you look at uh, going back to the third century BC, some of you may be familiar with the uh, famous book, The Art of War, the time period during the Warring States when this was written. One of the statements in it is in the Warring States Annals is Fu Guo Qiang Bing, which literally translates, it's ambiguous because of the way archaic Chinese works, but rich nations, strong army, or enriching the nation strengthens the army or enriching the nation builds power. And so this idea that having a strong economic background is necessary towards having great national power is a very old insight. And indeed, as you see in the bottom left with that picture of industrializing Meiji era Japan circa the 1860s, they reused this um, under the Japanese pronunciation, Fukoku Kyohei, but they re revisited this idea that by building an industrial base within Japan, that would enable them to have national wealth and national power. Similarly, the Prussian economist Friedrich List famously stated that the power of producing is infinitely more important than wealth itself. So the argument here from the Prussians, even before the unification of Germany, was that by having an internal industrial base is far more important for the strength of the state than is just being rich. And of course, if you go back a few centuries, as we will discuss and look at what happened with Spain in the Americas, national wealth is not necessarily valuable in the absence of the ability to produce. And then of course, the dapper gentleman there in the center, the former uh, president for life of South Korea, Park Chung-hee famously stated very pithily, steel equals national power. The argument that we as a country have to manufacture our own industrial goods in order to have a strong country. And this is not an alien concept to the United States as well. Alexander Hamilton famously stated the expediency of encouraging manufacturers in the United States, which was not long since deemed very questionable, appears at this time to be pretty generally admitted, which is a very late 18th century way of saying, until recently, no one actually thought it was important to encourage domestic manufacture, but now everyone agrees that it is. And then something changed. So we see that throughout history, there have been for centuries an argument that it is necessary to build internal industrial capabilities for a country to be a strong and stable and prosperous nation. But then in the period from roughly 1970 until arguably around the 2010s, perhaps even using 2016 as a transition point, an inflection point, something changed. There became an increasing view among economists, which was then accepted among the business management culture, began being taught in our business schools and even in our political science departments, which then of course bled into the polity more generally, that it didn't matter where things were made so long as there was the greatest efficiency of production worldwide. So indeed the argument became that trade is trade, goods are goods, it does not matter where things are made, each country should specialize in its own particular comparative advantage. And as a result, the argument in the 1980s that, oh, it's terrible that America is deindustrializing, economists argued that doesn't matter at all because the wealth still greatly accrues to the United States and everyone is richer thanks to free trade and the functions of the invisible hand, or so the argument went. But as I said, 2016 being an inflection point, things then changed again circa uh, 2017, 
And here, of course, we have that very famous statement from Peter Navarro that economic security is national security. So indeed, we have come full circle. So this argument that it really matters how and where things are made is once again central to our understanding of the global economy and international relations. So let's look at this a little bit more in depth. So primarily, what are fundamentally global supply chains? And so with this interesting chart that you can see, you don't need to see it in great depth, but it argues that there are very specific goods and services that are being produced worldwide and that certain countries produce different types of things more efficiently than others and feed them into a general global production network. And so the idea is that a global supply chain appreciates that different goods, services, or raw materials can be sourced in different regions worldwide with the greatest efficiency. And therefore the trick for both businesses and governments is to learn how to tap into those resources most efficiently. Now, one of the things that is very important to keep clear is the difference between a global supply chain and a global value chain. And I myself, as a scholar, unfortunately, frequently confuse the two. But indeed, while they are in some degree synonymous and often discussed um, in that way, they are actually distinct terms. And one of the major things to keep in mind is that Global supply chains simply refer to the means by which goods are produced from one location to another, from one firm to another, yielding the final product or service in the hands of the consumer. Whereas a global value chain argues about what is the amount of value added at each of those stages. And so you can begin to see quite immediately that a global supply chain analysis focuses on the where of where things are produced, whereas the global value chain concentrates on how much. So the argument from a supply chain is where the steel is produced, whether in Canada or the United States matters. Whereas from a value chain perspective, the argument that the patents on that steel making process being owned by a boutique firm in Pittsburgh and licensing that knowledge to a Canadian steel manufacturer means that actually more value arguably is added in Pittsburgh, or you could make this argument. So it doesn't matter that Pittsburgh doesn't make the steel. So you can see how depending whether you look at where versus how much begins to determine whether or not you see value chains or supply chains as being the key to understanding the global economy. So if you're taking a supply chain analysis, Let's look at this famous book published originally back circa 2003 uh, called Travels of a T-Shirt. Now, Travels of a T-Shirt was actually a very interesting book. I use it with my students when I teach an introduction to global trade. And it was basically arguing that they take a purely um, supply chain perspective, but it's purely value neutral. They don't argue that there's anything better or worse about where a good or service or input is produced. They're just interested in where and how it is organized, arguing that different regions indeed have certain competitive advantages. So the cotton that we, cotton clothing that we wear, interestingly, a very large amount of that cotton comes from right here in the US of A. Some certainly in here in South Carolina, but in fact, one of the largest cotton growing areas is my home state of Texas. The high plains of Texas is great cotton growing country. And so cotton, raw material produced in the United States, but the spinning and then the actual weaving of bulk textile, a traditionally labor intensive and low value added activity is largely done overseas. Until very recently, this was heavily, heavily done in China. But then the cutting and stitching, the final, um, final remaining truly labor intensive part of clothing manufacture tends to be done now in even cheaper locations such as Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, et cetera. But then if you're getting a t-shirt, whether one made specifically for an event that you're having or one from one of the brands that we buy, the printing, the, screen, the silk screen printing on the t-shirt is often done right here in the US of A, as is retail. But then after your clothing is done, what becomes of it? 
And indeed, some of it is sent whole scale to other emerging economies, sometimes to El Salvador, places in Africa, et cetera, sometimes as donations, but sometimes it is purchased in bulk and then resold. I always joke with my students, um, so we just had the Super Bowl. What became of all of the t-shirts for the uh, team that lost? All of those Super Bowl champion t-shirts were already produced. That way they could immediately go on sale the moment the game ends. Well, they didn't win. So what happens to those t-shirts? They end up getting sent overseas. So it's actually quite amusing. You can go to foreign countries and see an alternate history in which uh, losers have won Super Bowls, won World Series, et cetera. Another thing that's interesting about recycling of clothing is that uh, mattresses, car seats, the inserts into furniture can be made out of shredded clothing. And so one of the uh, reproduction, one of the ways that these things get recycled is done this way, but again, it's done overseas. So the point is that the supply chain for clothing is a multi-location, multi-firm process involving many countries. But this is just an analysis of where. What's interesting about the global supply chain approach is the, the way that that influences our timelines. And so we're about to come into the Christmas season. It's almost March, so it's almost Christmas time. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the city of Iwu in China. And Iwu is a huge wholesale center and manufacturing center for light manufactured goods. And indeed, if you go and buy Christmas ornaments or Christmas decorations or any of that stuff, the vast majority of it comes from the area around the city of Iwu. But what you then see in terms of a supply chain is how does that affect timelines? So typically speaking, um, January and February, the Chinese New Year season is a very quiet season in China for manufacturing, it tends to be rather the low season. But in February and March, when I visited, this is when the designs and the prototypes for the coming year are already created and then begin to become available. I was in the wholesale market in March seeing the sample products for the coming Christmas season already on display. So that from March to May, when the buyers of the world go to China to go and um, pick out their designs for the coming year, they can then begin placing their wholesale orders. May through September is high production season. But as we all know, if you go to places like Hobby Lobby or uh, Michael's uh, Craft Store, on July 5th, the Christmas stuff already begins to come out. So in, to some degree, it's even earlier. But production season May through September with final delivery then coming in October through December. So as I uh, often joke with my students, you know, it's March, so Merry Christmas to everyone. So with supply chains, one of the things that is very important to keep in mind, especially as we look at the PPE and the pandemic situation, is the time lag involved in a global supply chain. So when you think about something that they want to have on store shelves on November 1st, the day after Halloween, that this product was designed in February, ordered in May. So you think about it, this is a five, six, seven, eight month time lag. Is this a efficient way to run a supply chain in a national emergency? Now, when we look then not just at low tech products, whether Christmas decorations or t-shirts, the same sort of process also applies in very high technology supply chains, such as those for uh, mobile phones. So we think about um, companies like Apple, of course, being the famous example, where the rough design, and usually in the case of Apple, the software is designed in the United States. Um, this slide's a little bit old, so I still have Motorola, even though Motorola is not really in the business anymore, but principle stands. Oftentimes, specific operating software, as well as the guts of the phone, may be designed by a type of co uh, company in China. There's one firm called TechFaith that, as a supplier, they actually take the rough designs, the general architecture from the brand, and then proceed to actually integrate it and show how it will work together. Chips that power the phone, that, all, that do power management, that do the operating management, that actually connect it to the network, these tend to be US or Japanese designs. Uh, most famously, again, to boost Texas again, good old Texas Instruments. But Texas Instruments, although being based in the United States, the chips are actually fabricated in Malaysia. Many other companies fabricate in Taiwan or Korea. So this is a supply chain question. Is this a problem for the United States 
that while we design the chips and we own all of the intellectual property for them, does that matter that then the chips are made in third party countries? We can discuss this. And of course, even though the chips are printed in these big wafer disks in factories in Malaysia, Taiwan, and Korea, a step called packaging and test, which is the final actual fitting of the chip onto its uh, substrate and onto the uh, heat absorber, the insulator that surrounds it, that's often done in China. Of course, the motherboards that go into the phones are often printed in Taiwan, although increasingly in China as well. But the main step that is still done in China is the final assembly snapping all of the pieces together for then shipment, marketing, and sales in the United States. So from a supply chain perspective, this is wonderful because for the US design firm, this approach of having each supply chain stage done by the most efficient producer enables the best quality phone at the lowest quality or the, at the lowest price with the highest profit margin possible. So from a business perspective, it's brilliant, this global supply chain approach. But there's a different way of looking at this, which is the value chain argument. And the value chain approach simply argues that at each stage in the production of a good or service, a different amount of value is contributed into the final product. So you start with raw materials, into processing, into manufacturing, and then into retail and after sales services. And so when we start at the low end of this, raw material extraction arguably is the least value added activity. Uh, as Intel famously jokes about their, sem their semiconductors, their chips, they're made of silicon, which is sand. So there's absolutely the lowest value added material is going to a sand pit and extracting good quality silicon sand. Processing, turning that into manufacturing grade silicon is a value adding process. Then you get into manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. But it is the value chain logic that explains why for so many years during that period, 1970 to 2016, why we argued that it doesn't matter where things are made so long as the highest value is kept in the home country. So to this day, everyone says, oh, well, everything is made in China. Yes, but remember that of those cell phones, at most, maybe 10% of the value of that phone actually accrues to Chinese firms. So everyone talks about Foxconn, the manufacturer of Apple's iPhones, which is great, but Foxconn only makes about $2 per phone whereas Apple's profit is about $240 per phone. So from a value perspective, absolutely it doesn't matter where things are made because the bulk of the value is accruing to Apple in the United States and then to a lesser degree to the chip designers, and again, not TSMC that makes the chips, but the actual chip designers. So for many years, this argument held that value chains tell us that it doesn't matter where you make things, it matters who controls the highest value added stages, which interestingly, a manufacturer, uh, one Stan Shu of the company Acer, which is now a brand, but used to be just a bulk manufacturer of computers in Taiwan, argued that in value chains, it really does matter where you are. Stan Shu's company Acer did assembly of personal computers in the 1980s and 90s. And he argued that the value and therefore the profits to any given firm per unit of output really, really varies. And so the companies that do R&D or key components like the chips tend to have much higher value added and therefore much higher profit margins. When you get to the assembly stage, this is the lowest value added. This is where the Foxcons of the world are that are only getting one, two percent of the value of a product accruing to them as the one who does most of the work. Then of course, it interestingly goes back up again with sales and after sales services tending to be very highly value added activities as well. Uh, anyone who's ever had a cracked phone who needs to go to a cell phone repair shop knows about the value of after sales services. So the argument that Stan makes is this so-called smiling, the smiling curve. Basically, any company or any country 
wants to be at the left or the right side of the value chain. So in the production of goods and services, you don't want to do manufacturing from this value adding perspective because there's no value in it. Instead, you want to do design or you want to do after sales services. These are where you want to be. But this also depends on what do you value in your value chain. From a profit perspective, Stancher is absolutely correct. But if you value job creation, or you value questions of security and resiliency, and we will come back to this, then perhaps we should talk about the frowning curve. Because historically, it's been the exact inverse of this in terms of the number of jobs that are created in a given country or given region or given firm, it's the exact opposite with the assembly stage and then different key parts producing by far the most jobs that could be had. And so the frowning curve argues that if your concern is job creation, you do want to be in manufacturing and assembly, not in R&D or after sales because there are far fewer jobs created at this stage. Although it has changed somewhat, I used to argue that it, you know, it's wonderful that the United States has Facebook, but Facebook, this is back a few years ago, even though it was a multi, multi, multi billion dollar company, only had about a thousand employees at the time. So the real question was, how much are we contributing to the general economy of the United States by having this huge value adding enterprise that creates very, very few jobs? That was one of the arguments. In contrast, you look at a company like Foxconn, yes, they have very, very little value add and very, very low profits, but a single factory there might employ 100,000 workers. And while these 100,000 are certainly not well paid, arguably speaking, they are, by the what was then the standard in China, good, solid, blue-collar jobs. And as we'll discuss, Labor, of course, in China has gotten very expensive, and so this is no longer sustainable. But the other issue to keep in mind, especially as we discuss what do we value as a country in terms of value chains, is this blue line here. While historically there has been this very sharp frowning curve with lots of jobs at the assembly stage and much lower at the other ends, with automation, this curve has been greatly flattened. So while the image that we often have of a factory, you know, okay, we want to reshore manufacturing, bring the production back to America. Um, yes, that, okay, we can argue for this, but don't expect it to be factories full of hundreds or thousands of Americans making products. When a factory is brought back here, or even a new factory is built in China for that matter, they try to have as few workers as possible. So even assembly has relatively few workers. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit a steel mill in Taiwan, and it was a hot rolled steel mill. And it was producing you know, the great sheets of steel, but there were only five workers in this entire factory. There were five workers, and they worked in the control booth because the entire process was fully automated. So when we think about uh, supply chains as a job creation or a job location question, we need to keep in mind that technology may be changing both the frowning curve or the smiling curve and the frowning curve logic. So for many years, the easy answer to the question of where do we make things and how do we ensure the greatest value and greatest benefit accrue to our country, the solution was mercantilism. And so many accuse China, uh, and before that Japan, before that Germany or France, et cetera, of being mercantilistic. And so when we think about how the United States may want to respond to the challenges of global supply chains and global value chains, we probably should understand what we mean by mercantilism, lest we be subject to charges that were being mercantilistic. So in pre-industrial mercantilism, the famous stage that, you know, as a historically minded scholar, I love to look back to, there were a few assumptions about the way the world worked. Basically, states advanced their power through war. You'll remember if you study the 17th and 18th centuries, basically the great powers of Europe spent 200 years more or less constantly at war with one another. 
but war costs money. And the only real money is specie, gold and silver, especially gold. So in order to advance national power, the only option is to have economic policies that generate the accumulation of specie within the country. And so you should use tariffs to ensure that domestic goods are always favored and you should always have a positive balance of trade. The logic is that a positive balance of trade, i.e. you export more than you import or the value of your exports exceeds the value of your imports, this will bring gold into your country, hard currency, and therefore enable you to pay for war, to hire mercenaries to do what it is that you want to do. Sort of the quasi-modern analog of this, the United States is kind of the exception, but it's the accumulation of US dollars has become in many ways the accumulation of specie today. Why does China, Japan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, why do these play Thailand? Why do they have these enormous dollar reserves? It's because on the global marketplace, the only way to buy the things you need is with the modern day gold, which is the US dollar. So they have to accumulate it and they develop policies to ensure it, encourage the accumulation of that dollar within their country. So the basic theses of mercantilism, such as it is, are that all states desire security. And security is rooted in the quest for sovereignty. Now, of course, the pursuit of security necessarily makes other countries less secure. So when um, Singapore versus Malaysia, to go with two neighboring countries that always have sort of these spats with one another, when Singapore acquires high-speed tanks because they feel that in the event of a crisis, they would need to seize the water wells in southern Malaysia to ensure their supply of water, although this is a defensive measure to ensure they have access to water, high-speed tanks are an offensive weapon necessarily making Malaysia less secure. So pursuing security always creates a problem of generating the same fears in other countries. Now, of course, security, remembering our rich, uh, rich country, strong army, security consists of both hard security, your guns and bombs, and your economic security. Naturally, your economic security gives the ability to either buy using that hard currency or to make your weapons that you may need, those hard security questions. Further, economic security makes your government and your country free from the coercion of a foreign power. If you are Singapore, the simple fact that Singapore does not have the ability to generate enough water on its own, and they have, they have this thing called new water, which is a recycled water system trying to make them less dependent on water from Malaysia. Because that lacking the ability to generate this critical resource within the country creates an avenue for coercion by the foreign power. Relatedly then, in order to ensure economic security, states arguably must regulate markets since markets being a human creation do not function correctly, quote unquote, without state intervention. Markets are not organic according to the mercantilistic mindset. So you'll remember 1970 to 2016, markets are magical, markets are the way to go, don't interfere with the, mar uh, with the market. Yeah, mercantilists disagree. Markets are human creations and therefore are subject to human intervention. Further, if left to their own devices, markets do not serve the interests of state security and power, because if we think about it, purely relying on market logic says, don't make steel, make patents for steel processes or steel chemistry, and allow some cheap location to actually make the steel. But then the argument becomes, well, what if you suddenly need a lot of steel in a short amount of time? So markets do not enable that state security and power. So market regulation ensures the correct direction of market activity. Regulation will ensure that the state interest is served by the economy. Economic liberalization, therefore, should only happen in ways and on schedules that the state decides are in its best interest. Economic reform should not be an end in itself. The idea that we want to have greater economic liberalization, we want to loosen controls on industry, 
is not just because it's a good thing to do, it is to serve a specific interest. Why do we deregulate the airline industry? We do so because greater competition in airlines would enable greater access to air services, which would enable more efficient movement of goods and people nationwide, which will build the economy. So it's not deregulate because it's a good thing to do, it's deregulate because it has a specific outcome in mind. Therefore, governments must choose when and how they should liberalize. And that liberalization is contingent on continuing to deliver the goods that are sought and therefore is never irrevocable. There's no such thing as, oh, well, we've already got the perfect market, therefore we can't undo it. It is always from a mercantilistic mindset subject to fine tuning or adjustment by the state. It should the economy not be delivering the desired goods. So what does this mean in a more modern sense? It's the fact that globalization, despite the argument that, oh, we're in intertwined global supply chains, we're a network, therefore the government can't do anything, nonsense. From a mercantilistic mindset, the state always has the ability and the necessity to guide or protect their economies. So we had argued from 1970 to the 2010s that globalization was supposed to be creating a convergence of state interest in polities. Did not. Our economies became intertwined, but our national interests, whether from France or Germany or Russia or China or the United States or Mexico, all still remain distinct. Further, the losers in globalization, whether that be a working class in a developed economy or a emerging economy that finds it's only able to produce raw materials because that's all that they have a competitive advantage for, the losers, quote unquote, of globalization demand greater state action to interfere. Further, the winners in globalization naturally want to continue tweaking the system to ensure that the game of global economics continues working in their favor. And so from a mercantilistic mindset, the argument synthesized is we want to ensure that the global economy and global industry and global supply chains always benefit us, looking out for number one. That is the mercantilistic mindset. States, therefore, will continue to have difficulty solving multilateral problems. Pollution, human and drug trafficking, enforcement of trade rules, et cetera. Once it happens outside of your country, from a mercantilistic mindset, it's not really your concern. So historically, you've needed a single hegemon to control others and enforce order, whether that be the British Empire or the United States or some other system. The argument is that a single great power sees it as being in their mercantilistic interest to enforce a set of global rules. But remember, it's not irrevocable. If that hegemon, that great state, no longer sees the global system as being in their interest, they may begin to uh, neglect it or to actually actively turn against it. And arguably, this is what we're seeing in the post-2010 era, is that the hegemons, the would-be controllers, not just the United States, but the European Union and perhaps China, no longer see the global system from 1970 to 2016 as being so much in their interest anymore. So we're seeing that the mercantilistic mindset says, the old rules no longer benefit us, maybe we need some new rules. So how do you then buck the trend? If you're not gonna rely on the market, what is the tool that a mercantilistically minded state will use? And the answer is industrial policy. The use of state instruments, taxes, regulation, investment, market access, state ownership, to build and or support specific industries. Now, you'll remember, if you, uh, a lot of our audience will probably remember that industrial policy was the subject of much debate in the 1980s and early 90s, when in many cases it was confused with economic planning, what the Soviets used to do. But it's not the same thing. Industrial policy, the argument and the goal is to balance the primary, that be agriculture and extraction, secondary, manufacturing, and tertiary service economic sectors of the economy. Because the argument in the absence of industrial policy is that your primary and secondary sources, uh, uh, sectors, in an advanced economy will wither. 
in favor of the tertiary or the service sector of the economy, because this is where you have your competitive advantage. Industrial policy will try to balance this. Keep farms, we need food. Keep manufacturing, we need to ensure we can make things when we need to and have services. So industrial policy is designed to keep these in some degree of balance. Further, there's a balance within these sectors. How much basic manufacturing do we want? Do we want labor-intensive manufacturing or not? Do we need to make textiles or should we focus on so-called strategic goods? But then what is a strategic good? Industrial policy tries to balance within the sectors as well. If you're not the United States, your goal is to use industrial policy, as I had mentioned earlier, to accumulate those US dollars through the positive balance of trade. Because tariffs tend to be, although it's maybe shifting, less popular and sort of a dirty word, you use non-tariff barriers to ensure that your country has that positive balance of trade and to ensure that your secondary or primary industries are given the support they need to remain competitive. You can also then engage in the state funding of research and development or technology acquisition to strengthen whether a whole industry, primary, secondary, tertiary, or a segment within it, such as, we'll discuss later, artificial intelligence. This we see as a key part of the new tertiary economy. We need to invest heavily in it. The market will not do so, so the state will throw money at it. That's the idea. And therefore, your success in industrial policy will build your economic security over time. So we're gonna pause for a moment. I've been talking at great length. So we're now gonna do a quiz. Please read this quote from a Washington Post editorial and tell me what country this is talking about in terms of industrial policy. Any guesses? China. Okay, we have a vote for China. Germany. Uh, Hinger? Germany. Germany, okay, we got, China. we got China, we got Germany. United States. US of A, okay. Singapore. Darla, was that you? Yeah. yeah, Singapore. Singapore, all right. So we've got a couple of different votes. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and spill the beans. Uh, this is Japan. This was written about Japan uh, in 1987. And so the it's very easy. I used to have a joke with my students that what I would like to do as an experiment is to, although it'd be plagiarism and I would get in trouble, so I won't do it, but I want to, is take an editorial about Japan in the 1980s do a find replace and change Japan to China and see if I could publish it. Because all of the things we used to say about the Germans, especially in the, the Federal Republic of Germany in the 80s and 90s, especially about Japan during that same time period, are what we say about China today. And so this argument is that industrial policy is not a uniquely Chinese or German or Japanese phenomenon. It is very widely applied and often used as an explanation for why they tend to produce these enduring surpluses. But then the question becomes, how effective is industrial policy after all? And generally speaking, um, economists don't like industrial policy simply because since the 1970s, economists tend to favor the idea that um, the market is the most efficient when it's allowed to do its voodoo. In contrast, political economists, those who add the polity to the economy, tend to be kind of in love with industrial policy. The argument that it is possible to choose or to pick winners, whether an industry, primary, secondary, tertiary, or a specific sector, and do targeted interventions. And there are, of course, many instances in which we can say that there have been short to medium term effectiveness of industrial policy, whether Prussia and the German Empire, the Second French Empire, certainly the Japanese miracle through 1990, the Korean miracle through 1997, or arguably the Chinese miracle through 2009. But you'll notice that with the Japanese miracle and the miracle on the Han, in both cases, there's an end point. Why might that be? And it's arguably because industrial policy tends to become less and less effective over time because the ability of the state to choose and pick winning sectors 
becomes much less effective once a country reaches the global technology or industrial frontier. It's very easy if you're Korea in 1963 to know that we need a steel industry and we know how to build one because we know what a steel industry is. It's much harder in 1997 to say, now what do we need to invest in? What really is the wave of the future? Because you may say that, well, in 1997, the wave of the future is the internet. Great, you picked right. Or you might've said it's grid computing and you picked wrong. So it's very difficult to continue being effective at industrial policy, the more sophisticated your economy becomes. So there are also issues for every success, there are many failures. So um, I don't know if anyone remembers um, back in the 1980s that Brazil had a computer industry. And then also that Brazil used to be, I believe it was the world's sixth largest maker of cars. But the moment that that industrial policy said, okay, we have a domestic industry, let's try to liberalize the trade regime, that industry collapsed because it turned out it was completely ineffective or, and inefficient under that industrial policy-based protection regime. Similarly, in many cases to maintain the learning necessary to build these new industrial sectors, countries have to borrow on the global market. And so this tends to lead to debt traps as well as balance of payment crises, which were uh, replete throughout the emerging world in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So for every miracle on the Han, there was the Mexican peso crisis. So do keep this in mind before we jump into the joys of industrial policy. And of course, then there is the question of waste and missed opportunities, where because of a focus on one industry sector, perhaps the one that does become the great wave of the future gets missed because policymakers can be wrong. And you know we like to think that uh, we economists and we political scientists know what we're talking about, but um, we may not be right. Right now, I might say that I think the United States should really focus on promoting additive manufacturing, so-called 3D printing, as a focus for rebuilding a domestic manufacturing base. I might be right based on current trends, but I'm not a guru. I don't know where the market will be in 10 years. And so this could end up being a huge waste and missed opportunity. This is the danger of industrial policy. And of course, look at poor China. Does it actually still work? In many cases, the shift from the production of whole goods and whole industries to globally fragmented production in these supply chains makes it very questionable about how do you build an effective industrial policy. Further, in trying to build an entire industry, you may be missing out on the high value added components, which may be worth more to your economy and to your job creation or your security than the final product but maybe not, it's an open question. How do you balance production of goods versus services? And it depends on where do you place your value? Do you want more jobs? Well, you can get lots of service jobs because manufacturing now is fully automated, there are no jobs. So do we want to ignore manufacturing, ignore goods? I don't know. There's also the question of knowledge content. It's great that China's industrial policy has resulted in the indigenization of so much of the world's manufacturing. But the fact is, and China knows this, they are still fully reliant on foreign technology and foreign intellectual property to generate all of those goods. So this remains a big question. How effective was this industrial policy over time? And then there is the question, of course, of technology standards, one of my pet projects, which is, do you focus your industrial strategy on building the industry or on controlling the knowledge that goes into it so that no matter where goods are made, your country still has to be paid for it. So there are very open questions over the efficacy of an industrial policy in the modern world economy. So long story short, where does the United States fit into this world? So a few charts to start us off with. Number one, this is US GDP growth over the last 25 years. And it shows, if you're looking at sort of the general trend, is a slow reduction or a slow decline. There's a generally slow negative slope to annual GDP growth over time. 
Now we see we have the three recessions, the, uh, the dot-com bubble, which really wasn't a recession. Growth just kind of went to zero. But then there was the uh, financial crisis and then of course the COVID crisis. But even throughout all of this, the net average US GDP growth has been slowing down over time. Further, but we should also remember that despite all of the discussion, and this includes in the article that you may have read uh, from Great Decisions looking at this, US manufacturing output has not net declined during this period. During the so-called period when global supply chains were moving all this manufacturing to China, that period from 2000 to about 2008, you'll notice that US manufacturing was growing, net manufacturing output was growing during that time period. Now, one thing to do keep in mind, this is real output, which means it is the value of US manufacturers. So even though the United States may have had fewer manufacturing jobs and even made fewer widgets in net, the value that was being produced by US manufacturing continued to grow during this period. So again, do we look at it from a supply or from a value logic? This of course can then be seen in the balance of trade, which arguably, if you look at this long-term perspective on the balance of trade, this is, an, this is a backwards chart. So going back to 19, uh, 1950, all the way through the mid-1970s, the United States effectively had balanced trade. Not really a positive balance, but a neutral one, in which we exported and imported in roughly equal amounts. Starting at the end of the 1970s, though, you'll notice that we rapidly began running uh, sustained um, trade deficits. And then during the roaring 1990s, this great period, we were decidedly in negative trade and it remained as such. And then indeed during the China boom, this is when admittedly the trade deficit became the largest that it had ever been. Interestingly though, no matter what happened uh, post 2016, our trade deficit has still continued to increase even before uh, the uh, even before the COVID crisis, the United States is still consistently running a negative balance of trade. And so from a mercantilistic or an industrial policy perspective, this is decidedly bad. But one thing we should always keep in mind from that mindset, foreign countries use industrial policy and a positive balance of trade to get the gold, i.e. US dollars. How do we as the United States get dollars? Hengar? We print them. Yeah, we, we don't have to export. We can just print them to make dollars. So we don't need that same incentive. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that a sustained and massive trade deficit is necessarily a good thing, but it certainly says that the logic of industrial policy and mercantilism of trying to sustain a positive balance of trade doesn't necessarily apply in the United States. Because just like Spain in the 16th century, we get hard currency by digging it up out of the ground. We get uh, our gold by, make, by printing it because we can make as much as we want. And of course, if you, seeing that this is not just a, a post-2000 trend, we should always remember, don't just blame China. That many of the goods that we import come from many, many different areas around the world, whether it be Thailand or Japan or Singapore, Malaysia, et cetera. This is nothing new. So looking at the Sino-US situation, which was a very much a focus of that article on supply chains and national security, looking at the Sino-US trade in goods from a nominal perspective, the bottom sort of pe peach line, that is the annual US trade deficit in billions of dollars vis-a-vis um, -vis China. And then the uh, middle line, that is US exports to China, and the top line is Chinese uh, imports into the United States. And so what you'll notice is that only in the period post about 20, uh, post 2018 did the United States start to a limited degree importing somewhat less from China. 
Although um, it looks like this may have shifted somewhat because actually in net, China had its best year ever in 2020 in terms of its global trade surplus. China had a boom in exports in 2020. So how do global supply chains look today and where does this take us for the future? The simple fact of the matter is, is that from a supply chain perspective, China is the world's manufacturing superpower. In terms of share of global manufacturing output, it's China in position number one, followed then by United States number two. Do remember though, this is the supply chain perspective of where things are made and then shipped from not necessarily the value, because this 28.4% of all global manufacturing coming from China is based on the fact that the final iPhone is shipped from China, never mind that 98% of the value of that iPhone is not staying in China. But that is the share of global manufacturing output. More broadly, from a supply chain perspective, Asia is the center of global production today. 90% of the world's mobile phones are made in China, 90% of the computers, 70% of the televisions with much of the rest made in Korea. All of the consumer electronics, 38% worldwide is made in China versus 15% in North America, 14 in Europe, 12% in Japan, another 8% in Korea, et cetera. What this takes together is that it's not just China that makes things. From a global supply chain, China is a center of an Asia-based production network where many of the different stages and widgets and inputs are made in this grand factory Asia, the giant uh, uh, me uh, mecha Godzilla that we have here that would include South Korea, Japan, China, Malaysia, the Philippines, and increasingly Vietnam. And do remember that China is becoming very expensive for manufacturing. That's why many of the labor intensive manufacturers in China have actually gone bankrupt. Is that um, Vietnam is emerging increasingly as China's China. That Chinese factories are moving production to Vietnam because they need labor intensive work to be done inexpensively. So when we look at the pandemic and how it has impacted global supply chains today, COVID-19 Let's look at the story of what happened with COVID-19. So in November 2019, the first unusual pneumonia cases began being reported in Wuhan and began to attract the attention of local doctors. On December 31st, they closed the Wuhan seafood market, believing that this was the center of where this unusual pneumonia was coming from. January 3rd, China notified the, the not the WTO, that's a typo, it's the WHO, of the new SARS variant that they'd noted, a severe acute respiratory syndrome. However, two weeks later, there was still a massive New Year's gala in Wuhan. Everything still seemed to be normal. Don't panic, it's still under control, but clearly it was not because five days later they locked down Wuhan. One day later, they knocked down, locked down the rest of the province. By February 13th, the entire province and basically the entire country was under complete lockdown. And while in the United States, we all remember our COVID lockdown in March, April of last year, this was still not nearly to the same degree that they had in China, where um, generally speaking in many cities, for six weeks, you couldn't leave your apartment at all. You could go out to go to the pharmacy on every other day or go to the grocery store, and that was it. And this was how they brought the virus under control was by shutting down the country. What did that then do to global supply chains? Well, number one, it actually led to uh, problems in Vietnam, which is ironic because Vietnam very quickly and efficiently controlled the coronavirus crisis. They basically didn't ever have to lock down their country because through social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing regulations, they very quickly stamped it out and never had an issue. But even still, because a lot of the final assembly work in electronics or in garments or in other light manufactured goods occurs in Vietnam, they still had to close their factories because their Chinese suppliers in the supply chain were closed down because all of China was under lockdown. So there was a knock-on effect, even though Vietnam 
didn't have a COVID problem, they still had a supply chain problem because of the bottleneck within China. The closed shutdown within China, of course, meant that in the spring, worldwide demand for personal protective equipment, ventilators, and general medication inputs could not be satisfied as a result of this shutdown. The constraint in supply led to a very, very rapid increase in the price of medical equipment and products. You'll all remember uh, the discussion uh, in New York circa uh, last fall, last spring, where they were saying, look, we as a state are trying to buy PPE for our hospitals, but as a result with a limited supply, we keep bidding up the price. And with constrained supply, this then led to a rapid increase in prices. Now, pure market logic, rapidly increasing prices, limited supply, naturally what is going to happen is that there was a boom in China in the production of masks and other personal protective equipment. On February 1, 2020, at the height of China's lockdowns, they were only able to produce about 9 million masks per day in the entire country. By March 2nd, they were making 112 million. By April 30th, they were making 450 million masks per day in the country. So this is a massive boom in output because prices were high, demand seemed to be endless, but by April 30th, this is pre-summer boom in the United States, summer, uh, summer not boom, but summer uh, outbreak, global demand seemed to be slacking off. So wah, wah. the uh, result, of course, was a complete collapse of PPE production within China. So as the world supplier, they boomed, but then they went into bust. And what this sign says uh, very pithily is, uh, do not blindly uh, do not blindly go with the winds in uh, liquid fabric production, i.e., the uh, non-woven fabric that goes into masks, because in China there was such a craze for getting into mask production that people not just were converting factories, but were converting apartments and unused warehouses into factories to make masks. This, of course, led to uh, substandard production, but also to massive overproduction and the industry then proceeded to collapse within China. So what about the risks in the future for global supply chains? What does all of this mean for us and for our security? In general, we should always remember when we think about supply chains that the risk to it is based on a multiplicative risk of the failure at any step in the supply chain. So it's not just that it's the weakest, it's only as strong as the weakest link. There is the fact that let's say there's a 90% chance of success at any given stage within a supply chain. But if you have 10 links where it's 90% sure that every link will be okay, that means you actually only have 36% chance the whole supply chain will work. Similarly, even if you're 99% sure that every link will be secure, you still have a 10% risk of failure of the supply chain. And so there's a very real question is what is the acceptable level of risk? Can your company or your country accept a 10% risk of failure in your supply chain? And 10 steps is a simple supply chain. Many of these supply chains for many goods are now hundreds of steps involved. So even a 99.99% chance of success does have an additive risk. And there still is, of course, if there's one weak link, that of course can sink the supply chain as well. So how can we as a country or as a company think about how to address the risks in global supply chains? Number one is that as a value, as an economy, as a country, and as a company, we need to move from a mindset of efficiency to a mindset of resiliency. Hitherto, supply chains have been treated as the goal is efficiency. Achieving perfect just-in-time production is the end, the goal that we're trying to achieve. But really, it's a means to an end of efficient production. It shouldn't be worshipped as an end in itself. We need to think about that having a resilient supply chain and a resilient source of a good or service is equally valuable as having an efficient production. 
So we need to think about moving from cost to just to also having competency. It may be expensive to make a good or service or an input in one country or one region or another, but if they have the ability to do so, then that ability should be fostered and encouraged. Therefore, companies need to build in what will be costly redundancy. And many country, companies have already begun to do this with a China plus one or a China plus two or a right shoring, I believe is the term of art right now, a right shoring mindset that having multiple sources for any given component or any given stage is necessary. But by having multiple factories in multiple locations, that is redundant and may not always be needed at capacity. That's costly. Further, countries, if they want to have truly secure supply chains, will have to accept decreased, perhaps short-term, economic performance. You may also have to accept that if you want uh, a economy to be concentrated within a given location, a supply chain within a given location, that may result in global incompatibility of your products, which as a country, as a company, may limit the export value of the things that you make, because they may not be compatible with the standards or the production networks in another country. Further, the building of this security and resiliency in an economy is going to cost. And the question then is who pays for that? <clears throat> Do we pass that cost onto the consumer in terms of final, higher final prices? Or do we pass that cost on to the shareholders through lower profits and therefore lower uh, shareholder returns? Or do we pass that cost on to the taxpayer by using greater government subsidies to cover a greater and more secure supply chain? So somebody is going to have to pay for this. The question then is who? And we as a society need to choose where do we place that value and therefore who do we make pay for a more secure supply chain? And this question, even post COVID, is not going to go away. There are new and emergent industries for which the supply chains have not been fully established. And how will they be structured going forward? How are we going to uh, look at the generation of an artificial intelligence industry? Who will control it? What are the stages of production in it? And then where do we want them located? With a rise in robotics, fully automated manufacturing, how do we ensure that the production of the robots that make the robots, in addition to making the final products, how do we ensure a secure supply chain here? And then so on and so forth with all of these different industries. So we as a country need to think, what do we value? Is it security? Is it profit? Is it job creation? How do we balance these? Because it's not all one or all the other. And therefore, how do we balance these in terms of where we decide to encourage, not prohibit? You know, we are a free market economy, all things equal. We can't prohibit activities. But how do we use policy to incentivize specific location of activities to serve the values that we as a country want to support? And so with that, I will take a step down and open the floor up for questions. And I do really appreciate the opportunity that um, has been offered by this uh, Great Decisions uh, lecture series. So thank you again to Professor Kilroy and to um, everyone. So thank you for this time and I look forward to any discussion. Thank you, Michael, we appreciate it. And uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat session. Although I do want to start off by uh, offering the opportunity to ask questions to Darla and her students. Um, Darla Domke uh, Damonte is our Associate Provost for um, Global Initiatives. She's a professor of management. She's teaching a, an MBA course this semester. So she's got some students attending uh, the session this morning. So Darla, I want to open it up first to you or your students. Did you want to start us off with any questions that you, uh, you would have? If I may, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and throw one out there to, to, to get us started. I really appreciate the, the perspectives that you raised today, especially as it relates to the secondary markets. Um, as you look at these redundancies and the role of firms in this space and the layers of those action choices, what do you see as the most important uh, activities in terms of the, 
the restructuring of relationships within individual firms as they evaluate market potential and the redundancy question in support of that resiliency? I would say that the number one uh, stage in this is that a decision has to be made at the uh, upper echelons, at the C-suite corporate board level, a decision on what they're going to value as a company. Um, because I, for the last 40 years in the United States, the uh, mantra has been the generation of shareholder value, i.e. the production of the highest profits possible so that the greatest returns can be returned to the shareholder. And so if that remains, then the logic of the supply chain will still be to structure it as efficiently as possible and to reduce costs wherever necessary. If there is a shift to a more stakeholder perspective, but the question if you have a stakeholder perspective in which the argument is that your customers and your employees also have a stake in the viability and sustainability of your firm, then it becomes a question of necessarily having multiple sources. And what I would argue then is you have the high cost, high reliability location should be targeted, but also the low cost, but potentially higher risk location as well. And so you would want to balance having your general go-to location, which may yet well still be China or Vietnam or Myanmar or India or wherever it may be. But then on the other side is the question of uh, guaranteeing you have a high cost but high reliability backup. And so maintaining these is costly. And then as a company deciding, do we then accept lower profit margins to support these higher operating costs? Um, so I would say that the number one question for companies is not how do we structure it, but do we agree to accept that there are going to be these costs which hitherto have not been part of them, not really been widely considered. Good, we have a, we have a question from Sammy. Sammy asked, did the Trump tariffs work or not? And in what way? That is a great question. Thank you so much for asking. And so what I would say is, um, depends on how we define work. What was the goal of the Trump tariffs? If the goal was the reshoring of manufacturing, no, they didn't work. They did not encourage reshoring of manufacturing to any extensive degree. If the goal was to somewhat encourage American firms to reconsider their operations in China, to a certain degree that may have worked. There were surveys done of the American Chamber of Commerce in China at the height of the tariffs in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And they were asked, how has this affected your business? And the argument is, yes, it has affected our profit margins and therefore our calculus. But the vast majority, a tiny number, less than 10, less than 10 said they were considering some reshoring of manufacturing to the United States. Most were considering locating activities in a third country. So keeping their China operations but also then oper creating new factories elsewhere in Asia or perhaps in Latin America as an alternative to China. So if the argument was to try to change some strategic calculus, then maybe it was effective. But if the goal was reshoring, then not particularly. Jenny asked a question and as an educator, you, you can respond well to this one, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Could not the US positively affect its economic security through public education curriculum? Uh, that would seem to give the biggest bang for the buck across the secondary and tertiary sectors over time. What's your thoughts on that? I would say definitely. If um, And as a business school academic, uh, I would say that we owe a, um, a great mea culpa for creating this mindset of a cult of efficiency and a cult of shareholder value, because that's what we teach in our business schools and in our MBA programs as a general rule, especially in the United States. And if you teach that, and then that becomes the next generation of business leaders, that mindset will become standardized. So <clears throat> at a multiple levels of education, teaching the values of understanding how the global economy works, the values of sustainability, the values of resiliency, if that is made a core value, that will over time percolate into the system. So very good point. So Hanger asked, how does the U.S. manage the supply chain policy consistently when potentially every four years government policy can change dramatically? 
Okay, this is a great one. And I'm going to now step down from my uh, pontification seat and put on my opinion hat, which is, I would say that the problem is that uh, Congress has has uh, delegated all of its responsibility to the executive branch, resulting in rule by policy rather than rule by law. And so if we, because laws are hard to change, policies are easy to change. Every four years, you can change policy. So the tariffs, if you are a company thinking about how to structure its supply chain circa 2017, tariffs have begun to come into effect against China. Okay. Do I invest a hundred million dollars to build a new factory in Thailand to get away from these tariffs? Well, maybe, but in three years, these tariffs may be gone. Is it worth the risk now or do I just take the cost for three years and hope for a change of administration? In contrast, a wholly new trade regime set by law is much more difficult to undo. Laws tend to be sticky things. And so I would say that um, the fact that in the United States we tend to rule by policy much more than by law today would, at least in my opinion, makes it so that companies have a much more difficult decision-making process if they want to think about reshoring because there's no guarantee that the incentives for doing so will remain in effect a few years later. And so um, it's very difficult for uh, companies to decide how to behave under a system where every four years within a change of the executive, we might have a very radical shift in economic regime. This next question is actually one I, I shared this article with one of my students who's actually writing about uh, on their capstone paper, comparing China's uh, aviation industry or primarily their military aviation comparing to the U.S. aviation. And the Financial Times reports that China's considering curbing exports of rare earth to U.S. impacting defense contractors, especially the F-35 in particular, depending on some of these rare earth minerals. So, so what do we do? How do we, you know, so do we choose security over value in these cases? Uh, this was actually mentioned in the uh, in the Great Decisions article, the specific question of rare earth. One of the problems with rare earths is that they are rare and they do not occur universally distributed in the earth's crust. There's a mine for rare earths in um, California. And I believe there's another one in Wyoming, I think, I'm not sure, but um, there are a limited number of these mines in the United States. China in Inner Mongolia has very large deposits of it. One of the problems with rare earths is that their extraction is very energy, water, and other intensive and tends to be highly polluting. It's a very difficult set of resources to extract. And so it becomes a very big question, how do you within a country decide to produce these if you want to produce them domestically? Although interestingly, I believe it was last year, one of the small uninhabited outlying islands of Japan basically a pile of little mud flat island turns out to now be the world's largest strike of uh, rare earths in recent years. And so this is a question then, great, Japan is a US ally. Is that considered a more reliable source of rare earths? It might be a larger strike and greater availability than what you have in the United States. And even if we promote the domestic production of rare earth metals, this is great, our rare earth elements, but the supply may well not be sufficient for the domestic industry. There may still be a requirement to rely on global supply chains. How do you then negotiate that vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, et cetera? Because unfortunately, when it comes to digging things out of the ground, the balance is not even. And so you have to decide how you're gonna negotiate this going forward. Hmm. So John asked, uh, wouldn't the mechanization of manufacturing that lowers the use of labor as shown in your diminished jobs graph be the answer to returning manufacturing jobs to the U.S., even if not the jobs themselves? Yes, quite potentially. Um, this very much could be a, a real way to move forward that manufacturing could be done efficiently anywhere in the world, but that would still require, back to the education question, a change in the mindset towards the value of the production stage in manufacturing or in an industry. Because for the last 30 odd years, production has been considered by default a low value adding activity and therefore not one that you want to do 
either within your firm or certainly within a high cost location. So even if it is possible, thanks to automation to make everything domestically, do you still want to do so as a company if you think that, well, it costs me $150 million to build this fully automated factory. I don't want that capital outlay because the value added by making it is still so low. So there's still a question as a business, do you want to internalize that activity and do it within the borders of your country? So it's certainly possible to do so, but the question is, is do we wish to do so? Got one, a question from one of our, our Canadian participants, our snowbirds that, that didn't, didn't come down this year. Um, but, uh, but ASUS asked about, you know, wondering about the impacts of policy on industrial policy, uh, particularly in Canada, where the absence of a capacity to produce COVID vaccine has resulted in low availability when contracts were signed to vaccinate all Canadians. Um, so what is your impact? I mean, Canada obviously has much more, uh, you know, direct impact on industrial policy, maybe the United States in some cases. So um, naturally, your ability to have an industrial policy does uh, sometimes in, uh, mandate longer term investments in a product productive capacity. And so one of the problems with industrial policy is that you have to think in terms of decades of restructuring to build that capacity within your economy in order to move forward with whatever your goal might be. So if your goal as Canada is to have a fully independent pharmaceutical industry that can't be built overnight. And so there would need to be a willingness to invest and subsidize and support the indigenous production, not just of final medications, but of the uh, raw material inputs, the sort of the generic chemicals that go into many medications. And this is a multi-year, even <laughs> generational process of rebuilding, which is very difficult to go back to the question of four-year horizons, if you're, as a government, only thinking of the next election, you don't want to be on the hook for an investment that will not pay off for a decade, because you, as a politician, will not receive any benefit from that. Interestingly, in Japan, why were, I would argue, why were they so good at industrial policy for so long? It was because Japan had one ruling party from 1955 until 1995. For 40 years, the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, the joke being neither liberal nor democratic nor really a party, but the LDP ruled Japan for 40 years. And with that kind of stability, you could make longer term commitments and longer term investments, knowing that as a collective, you would still be given the benefits from that. I'll say the last, last question actually is from Barbara, and I'll, I'll answer this one. Uh, Capstone is the... Um, it's the final research paper that our students in the Intelligence and National Security Studies program have to produce. Uh, the capstone course is at the end of their uh, program of study. And so they do have to actually produce a fairly substantial research project. And the big difference and challenge for them is it's not just a descriptive paper, which is what a lot of their, their coursework has been previously. Uh, this one is meant to be analytical. It needs to show critical thinking. Uh, they need to have some type of a thesis statement or an argument. Uh, they have to have a methodology on how they're going to support that argument and, and show analysis that they've actually been able to do that, you know, compare and contrast, case study method. Uh, we also teach something in the intelligence community called structured analytical techniques, where they could apply it to producing a simulated national intelligence estimate. So, so this is, this is uh, for our students, it's their ways to kind of demonstrate you know, what they've learned in the, uh, throughout the course of the four-year program. But that paper is also then possibly a ticket into maybe graduate school, you know, shows that they can work at a higher level in graduate school, uh, but also for their interest in the intelligence community. So a lot of the students write about topics related to where they want to work in the future, uh, whether it's homeland security. A lot of students are very focused now on, on domestic terrorism since that has uh, become a new topic. So, uh, so the capstone paper is their way to demonstrate that they've been able to apply the things that they've learned uh, throughout the program. Um, I've got one final question here from Paul B. And then I think this will be our last one. Uh, it says, companies have to work on the basis of bottom line and return for their shareholders. Therefore, they have to be as cost efficient as possible. Doing this through automation leaves a lot of unskilled labor on the cold. What do we do with all these people to help them survive? Wow. Thank you, Paul, for that extremely difficult question and one that I can't begin uh, to address. So I'm going to plead ignorance on this one. But there are many smart people who are trying to answer this question. And one of the arguments is that it's not just a question 
of manufacturing labor being uh, being redundant, it's service labor becoming redundant. We all know that when you go to the grocery store now, you're strongly encouraged to check yourself out. We want fewer grocers and baggers. We want fewer. Um, I was in Walmart the other day, and I, uh, it reminded me of being in factories in China because the little Walmart floor sweeper is now an automated machine that drives itself. That's another job, hitherto an unskilled job, which is now gone. This is going to be a trend throughout the economy that we don't need large numbers of people to perform lots of different services. And companies naturally, um, as they saw even in China, putting a new robot on the production line, yes, it's a one-time capital outlay, but it pays for itself within a year or two of saved wages. So very quickly, companies are realizing that automation is the way to go across both production and on the service side. So how do we support a society where we don't necessarily all need to work or we can't work? Do we go with the Andrew Yang idea of the universal basic income? Maybe. Do we go with the idea that as a society, we need to rethink what is the purpose of life? Um, for the, since the industrial revolution, the focus of the day of the adult life has been work. That's what we have all done. Maybe we need to rethink what it is that it means to be human, to be alive, to be productive, to be contributing. But these are great philosophical questions that are way above my assistant professor pay grade. So <clears throat> um, I look forward to uh, any of your insights into how we might want to move forward with that. Good. Well, Michael, thank you so much. I did, I did see one other question. Christian asked, is this a PDA credit? Uh, yes, Christian, contact the uh, PDA coordinator in the Wall uh, College of Business. I did provide them information about this program uh, to encourage that it be considered. Uh, it's professional development activity for, for uh, business students to attend programs like this. So uh, follow up with the, uh, and I can't remember who that is right now, but the PDA coordinator in the Wall School, let them know that you did attend the program and, and that should, uh, should be able to count for your credit for a PDA activity. So. Listen, th uh, Michael, thanks again. Great, uh, great to have you back with us. We really appreciate it. Again, very, very timely topic, very well uh, presented. And the neat thing about it is we actually got a twofer uh, because you talked a lot about globalization and the other, one of the articles in the uh, program this year, the one we didn't do is actually the question is, is, is this the end of globalization? And I think you addressed a lot of those issues that a lot of people are facing right now when that seemed to be the panacea for, uh, for a lot of struggling countries. Uh, to jump on the globalization bandwagon. So, so anyway, thank you again, Michael. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have one final meeting uh, that will be next Saturday and that will be Professor Richard Adu in our program at Coastal Carolina. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, China in Africa. So we'll continue to be looking at China as well next week. So again, thank you all for coming. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. So. Thank you so much, Rick. And thank you everyone. And thank you, Coastal Carolina. Bye now.